in the comfortable cage of Pallet Town, the sunny mornings, the friendly Pokemon that give you ease and comfort, you lie there with a dream. A desire to leave this cage and explore what's really out there in the world. After all, this world is a vast place full of the unknown. There are mysterious Pokemon that have yet to be discovered. The friendly pet Pokemon you have running around in your backyard aren't the same as the ones out there. Out there, the Pokemon are vicious, broken, and won't hesitate to attack you on first notice. It's scary for a 12 year old to venture out there and so you sit there waiting in fear and anticipation of the day you finally get to set out. After all, there's no way you could possibly take that step into that world of unknown, into that realm of gentle peace and malevolent chaos. You've been given nothing special, you're just an ordinary boy without a Pokemon. What hope do you have of accomplishing anything? You remember your best friend, his grandfather, a renowned Pokemon master and professor, and himself, a pretty strong Pokemon trainer on his own, constantly saying how he's going to become the strongest trainer in the world. That powerful ambition is riveting, and it sparks a fire within you that makes that outside world seem like an adventure. And so, you the hero, instead of sitting idly and waiting for life to happen, waiting for circumstances to be just right, sets out with fear, doubt, and some regret, but nonetheless, you set out. If it wasn't blindly obvious from the music I use in my videos, I've been a Pokemon enjoyer for as long as I can remember. My first video game or even digital experience was with Pokemon Black, and throughout my childhood I played pretty much all the games from Gen 3 up to Gen 7. I do have my thoughts on the Gen 8 and 9 games, but uh, I probably shouldn't be giving my thoughts so early in the video. One of the things I've always wanted from Pokemon was a darker version of the immense story and lore, something that would just bring out the characters in the world a whole lot better than Ash Ketchup and his 25 year journey as a 10 year old. After all, Pokemon has immense lore and a ton of potential for incredible story writing, but obviously they just never seem to do it. Indigo League was really fire, really nostalgic, but objectively speaking the story was nothing special. I looked into the medium that this channel was based off. I searched manga up and down to find something, some sign of a Pokemon manga that would be good and I found the Pokemon Adventures manga. I'd read pretty much this entire thing when I was a kid, and from what I can remember, the story was much better than the anime could ever hope to be, especially the black and white narrative, which had an ending that you really wouldn't expect from a series like Pokemon. But after looking back on it after many years, I realized that it still doesn't give me that which I desire. It's not that darker, more adult story with deeper themes, the artwork isn't anything mesmerizing. So you can imagine the look on my face when I stumbled upon the Pokemon fan manga called Festival of Champions. This is unironically, undoubtedly, the best experience of the Pokemon story that I've had to date. The story revolves around the protagonists of the Generation 1 games, Red, Green, and Blue. Green is the archetypal perfect kid who is the best at everything and has all the potential in the world to become the greatest trainer like his grandfather. You know that old fuck who's the first face you see when you open your fire red copy on the Game Boy Advance? Then there's Blue who's the female protagonist with a laid back personality and no real dreams of her own, though she does have a backstory that's very touching and perfect for her character. And then of course we have Red, who wants to be the greatest Pokemon trainer ever. Except he doesn't. No, Red doesn't have this dream of his own. In fact, he doesn't really have a dream. He doesn't really want a Pokemon and he doesn't know what path to take in his life. That's the real Red, an unambitious kid who only wants to be better than his rival Green without any real path of his own. He's a realistic representation of what a Pokemon trainer actually feels, looking at that vast, mysterious world and fear that crushes any path he tries to walk down. But when he sees Blue in his ambitious perfection, he feels something and some fire lights up within him that gives him some hope. But even then, the world is such a scary place and he feels conflicted about going out on his adventure. One day, Red finds a Pikachu in his shed, but it's not any normal Pikachu. It's one that's been beaten and abused by its previous trainer and left to die by its herd because it wasn't strong enough. Pokemon, after all, are animals in a way and they have their own laws and ways of living. In the wild, the weak die and the strong survive and these Pokemon live by those rules. They're not just slaves to be used for battle, and this manga shows that. They form bonds with their trainers and other Pokemon that become the center of this manga's emotional expression, alongside the mental states of the characters, which is something that Pokemon never really ends up showing us. In the anime, the focus is more on the battles and Ash's progress to becoming the greatest trainer. In the video games, the protagonist that you play as hardly has any character because, you know, 
he literally never talks. But in Festival of Champions, these characters exude passion in every single line they utter. Green's burning desire to attain power and the hole left in his heart from the tragedy he suffered. Blue's ability to bond deeply with Pokemon despite her past trauma of touching Pokemon. And Red's dream of exploring the world and making it to the pinnacle of Pokemon training. Their goals are unique and they aren't linear. They aren't goals that develop from childhood passion or naivety, but through life experience. Something that's rarely explored in the other mediums that Pokemon is in. Green was never obsessed with power. Red was never passionate about raising Pokemon and entering the Indigo Plateau. Blue her whole life was scared to touch Pokemon or even go near them, but they all end up developing such powerful bonds. Some for the good, and some for the not so good. When a character is built too linearly, they suffer from stagnation, like Ash so often does. But these characters are so complex, it's hard to believe they're really 12 years old. That's probably the only gripe I have, if you could even call it one. For such mature themes like the meaning of life and finding a passion and a purpose, it's hard to really see 12 year olds fitting into that role. But if you kind of ignore that aspect of the story, the themes and portrayal of the themes are incredible and definitely unexpected from a series like Pokemon, which is what makes Festival of Champions so unique. Festival of Champions revolves around the Indigo League tournament you play through in the main series Gen 1 games and its remakes, except it isn't nearly as boring and linear like the other aspects. It's not about Red going chamber to chamber to battle Lance in his 16 pixels. It's a giant tournament where a bunch of well-known trainers from the mainline games come together in a tournament to see who comes out as the new champion. The competitors aren't just Kanto and Johto competitors, in fact they come from all different regions. The Kanto and Johto Ali4 are among the strongest and there are gym leaders like Misty, Skyla and Vulcaner bringing in a variety of characters from different generations of the games. The battle between Red and Misty for me is a perfect example of how this manga separates itself from other representations of Pokemon. Misty has been portrayed in so many ways through the anime, the adventures manga, the video games, and of course rule 34. But this Misty isn't just another obstacle or a tomboy who is in love with Red. She has dreams of her own, and when she loses, she feels bad about it. She doesn't just hand Red the gym badge, she truly feels something deep inside of her because she had a dream as well. You actually see this character come to terms with having failed to accomplish her dream, and you even get Red's side of it, how he had to sacrifice somebody else's dream for the sake of his own, which is one of the many lessons that he has to learn. One-off characters that come into the picture and go have so much character and personality it's impossible to forget them. Karen and her desire to express the beauty of the newly discovered Dark-type Pokemon, Skyla's goal of surpassing her grandfather and becoming the gym leader of Miss Charlton City with the elegance of Flying-type Pokemon, Blue's expression of the bond between a Pokemon and the trainer, and how much that can go through such a scary adventure, and so on. Then you have the menacing Elite Four that just stand behind the glass and watch with curiosity. The Ice Queen Lorelei, the Brain and Brawn of Bruno, the Sinister Avenger Agatha, and the Cunning Dragon Master Lance are all characters that actually live up to their hype as the four strongest in the world. They're not just some boss who wish you good luck and spam Leer when you're at 1 HP. They don't even need to spam full restores because they not only have extremely powerful Pokemon, they have loads of experience, strategy, and bonds with their Pokemon something that the mainline games never really replicate. They aren't necessarily friendly either just because you're a kid. In fact, they'd happily have you dead if you stood in the way of their position, and this makes it so much more appealing and tense. Like I said, they deploy strategies that you never see in the mainline games, because the combat strategy in the mainline games is a lot different than the manga. The manga has a lot more freedom, as characters are allowed to use multiple moves at a time, they're allowed to act before their opponent, and certain moves have different effects, like double team, creating multiple different copies of the Pokemon itself, not just raising evasiveness like in the games. It's much more diverse and allows for a broad range of strategy, which is probably why these characters can be so much stronger than they are in the games. Now as I mentioned, this is a tournament, but the author, who might I add, is a fan. He's not even a known author, he's a fucking fan. Adds backstories that highlight the road the characters took to get here. And to me, this is where Festival of Champions shines. Ironically, it's not just a festival, but it's the people who walk into the festival and their stories individually. Remember when I talked about Red's Pikachu and where he found it? Well, this Pikachu alone endured enough suffering to bring a grown man to tears. He's not just a Pokemon given to Red by Professor Oak. He's a broken down shell of a creature he used to be. Born into a herd of Pikachu in Viridian Forest, this Pichu was born with the inability to discharge powerful electricity. This ability is what allows the young Pichu to be accepted into the herd and what allows it to finally evolve into Pikachu. But of course, due to this condition, the Pichu could never do it, and so 
he didn't fit into the herd. He didn't feel a sense of ambition, a sense of strength and community with his herd. And of course, he couldn't evolve. So he was abandoned because of something that he was born with. Pokemon are portrayed much like humans in this way, and it shows us that a fundamental law of nature is present in the Pokemon as well, giving them so much more life and showing that again, they aren't just simple tools for battle. A member of Team Rocket eventually winds up catching the Pichu with the hope of raising it to become stronger than Lieutenant Surge's Raichu, the electric type gym leader. Through this training, Pichu finally evolves and gains a sense of accomplishment for what he and his trainer were able to do. For once, he had someone on his side. This trainer would be proud of what he was capable of. He would finally accomplish something great. He would finally find his purpose in life. Again, this is unlike the Pokemon series that first comes to mind. This Pikachu is still incapable of being as strong as Surge's Raichu, and when the trainer realizes this, he shows his cruelty without hesitation. Beaten nearly to death, this Pikachu returns to his herd, but of course he's not allowed in, as when a Pokemon leaves its herd, it gains a human scent, and due to this, it will never be allowed back into the herd. And so broken in body and mind, Pikachu runs away on its own, finding a way to survive in his misery. Seeing other Pokemon bond so well to humans, he wonders why it was never like that for him, why his life winded up this way. And he begins to blame humans for it and feels deep resentment towards them. And then he meets Red. Red, who feels he has no power to become a great trainer and who fears taking that step into becoming the trainer and a wounded Pikachu with trauma and distrust towards humans. Both lacking something from birth, Red has no special ability to feel Pokemon like Blue. He isn't knowledgeable like Green. Pikachu wasn't able to release electricity well from birth and was banished from his herd. These two heal their wounds to their bond and become a powerful team that propels them into the Festival of Champions. Their two broken paths come together to illuminate their true purpose together. Together, and through their bond, they both find the meaning of life. It's these aspects of the story that make the battles and characters so much more meaningful and that show you the real meaning between the bonds of people and Pokemon. Being two sides of the same coin in a way, Red and Green contrast each other throughout their journeys. Green was always ahead in everything and Red followed behind it. But after taming Pikachu, Green saw something in Red that he did not have. He saw his ability to overcome and to bond with Pokemon, creatures he only saw strategically and never emotionally. Green feels some envy when Red bonds with Pikachu. Pikachu because he was handed Eevee without struggle, but Red had to work for Pikachu's acceptance. He thinks that maybe there's something that Red is better than him at. But does that really matter? Because if I'm stronger than him, I'll become the greatest trainer before he does, so all I need is power. And so Red bonds more with his team, and Green begins to bond more with the power of his team. The biggest consequence of this power-hungry pursuit manifests itself in one of Green's Pokemon, but I'll save you the pleasure of exploring that on your own, as I've already given away a decent amount of the manga. But I'll just say this, if you know what happens in the mainline games, you'll know what happens in this manga, except as everything else is, this is expanded so much further and impacts so many more characters than you would expect. This storyline skyrockets Green's character to the moon and makes him my favorite in the series because of how he has to overcome this event and because of how he clings to power and why he clings to power. This part of Festival of Champions might just be my favorite, which is why I won't speak on it any longer in case you still haven't checked it out yet. This manga has been ongoing for quite a while and only has 15 chapters, plus some of the prologue chapters. The reason for this low chapter count is 1, because the chapters are really long, and 2, because the artwork in this manga is better than 90% of manga out there. Keep in mind that this was drawn by a fan. Not only is the artwork that's elite, but the paneling is incredibly well thought out and professional. A manga can have good artwork, but mediocre paneling and things just won't feel right. The moments won't hit the same because each page tells a story. If you have multiple boxes within a panel, they must connect in ways to bring out the intended emotion. This manga has some of the best paneling I've ever seen, and it's part of the reason why each moment hits how it's supposed to. The battles are exhilarating, the backstories are sorrowful, and the wholesome moments are wholesome. You can see what I mean about the paneling through the Pikachu backstory like I said. Just take a look at this panel, how he uses different shades of darkness to illustrate Pikachu's world of black and white. Then there are the different textures depending on the mood of the scene. In a vicious battle between two hounds, the texture is rough and scratchy, whereas in a battle where Red embraces his Pikachu, the texture is smooth and elegant. There's also the use of white panels and black panels in certain drawing styles like fading effects or hard lines to really bring out the emotion of the moment. These little things combined with the tense dialogue and mature themes gives a different feel to the Pokemon franchise, which is why I think this manga really works. It's a huge breath of fresh air from the generic themes expressed in the original series. Also with the artwork is the use of eyes. You might have been wondering why anime and manga draw such big eyes. Well, it's because the emotion of the character lies in its eyes. Not only are the eyes drawn extremely powerfully in the human characters, but also in their Pokemon. 
I ain't never seen a Pikachu with eyes like this. The look of a broken Pikachu versus when it's embraced by the meaning of life. The passion in Red Awakening versus the rage he has for the world. The pride of Karen's houndoom versus its vicious nature. All of this is expressed through the eyes and combined with the artwork, you have characters and creatures that feel real. As it's based on the main series games to an extent, one can try to predict how Festival of Champions will end, especially when we consider the foreshadowing. The protagonist of the Johto game's gold is present as a spectator in the tournament, which might suggest his importance in a later arc, maybe like a Johto arc. Then there's numerous metaphorical examples of Red climbing to the peak of a mountain, and if you played the mainline Heart Gold Soul Silver games, you'll know who's standing atop Mount Silver and who goes to fight him. But of course, this is all in the fun of speculation. Now I will say, although this story is incredibly written and drawn, it suffers from one big problem. Yeah. As I said, this is a fan manga, which is why the upload schedule is inconsistent and chapters come out every few months at best. It's also why you probably won't find this manga on some websites. Because it's drawn by a fan, there isn't a big team working on it at once, so the publishing schedule is never quite going to be good. Unless, of course, this fan manages to pick up a team for the series and begins publishing chapters a lot more frequently. It's also not being published within any magazine, so of course, the author can take his time with it, and rightfully so, because quality is extremely important. Other than this slow release schedule, though, Pokemon Festival of Champions is easily the best Pokemon experience I've had since playing Black and White 2 because yes, they were the best Pokemon games ever made.